Welcome back to the Nerd Bench, everybody. There are new motors for drag racers. The DRX series of XC Run motors is out. We have three different KVs and two different sizes. We're gonna pop these guys open and take a look. So this is the 9500 KV version. That's right, 9500 KV. That is a lot, but that's what the drag racers want. This, these are four pole motors. There's an 8500 KV version as well. And they are both, you know, externally the same size. Uh, pop the box open. Ah, the angels sing every time, right? And look at that guy. Oh, the can is absolutely beautiful. I, I really like the super vented motors like this because it's almost like it's a see-through motor. But there you have it, the DRX3652 in the XE Run series of Hobby Wing Racing products. Uh, take a look. It's got the dual sensor ports for your different variations, and it does have the adjustable timing as well. Now, you see here it's got counter counterclockwise CCW and CW rotations, and that is to adjust timing positive or negative whichever direction you go. There's no zero, so this guy, you know, you start at 30, you can go down to 20, up to 40 type of deal. Um, so when you do run these in a reverse motor rotation, just make sure your speed control is set up for that because it does have to have motor rotation as an option and speed controls that have that have an offset that's built in to compensate for that that 30 degrees that's in there so meaning simply you run it forward and backwards you get the same performance heavy duty solder tabs on the top and as the numbers imply this is a 36 millimeter diameter by a 52 millimeter length the 540 size motor if you will and the these the smaller size motors have the normal 1 8 uh, size shaft, the 3.125 millimeters. Uh, so that's enough of that. Let's pop open the other one. So this guy's a little bigger, the 3652. Ah, and you'll sing every time, I tell you, I, I can hear it. Pop this guy open. And the 3662 is going to be 10 millimeters longer. It's a 62 millimeter length, still re retains that 36 millimeter diameter. And with the larger size motors, you do get the heavy duty five millimeter pinion shaft. Uh, but still, everything else pretty much the same. Got the dual sensor ports, got the adjustable timing, the venting and styling is very much the same, the heavy duty solder tabs as well. Before we pop these guys open, I do have a tunalizer here. I wanna run them on a tunalizer so you guys can see uh, what those guys look like as far as tunalizer. Numbers. I've got the tunalizer hooked up to a battery. I've got it hooked up to the motor correctly, A, B, and C. Uh, I've got the tunalizer set to four poles and it is set to the two cell test voltage. We're just gonna run the auto motor test because that's pretty easy. That thing screams. I really don't like running high KV motors on the 2S test. I normally do everything on a 1S test, but I know what you guys are going to say, so I'm going to do it anyway. So test voltage you see there, 7.4, and it draws 9.25 amps. The KV is here at 6,700, so a little higher than what the it says on itself, and then it's set to 27 degrees of electronic timing, so it actually measures the end bell timing inside the motor. We go down to the next one. Your deviation shows the variance of the sensor readings so if how close they are the lower is better uh, rotor asymmetry again that's another one where lower is better and it tells you how equally charged the rotor reads and the hall signal deviation is the difference in the strength of the sensor reading so still lower is better on that so all, all pretty good numbers there so that just gives you a basic idea of what it looks like out of the box uh, let's hook up the 9500 up next we're going to do the 9500 kv the 3652 i don't have the 8500 kv but uh, for this test i changed the tester to one cell voltage because on two cell that's just way too much rpm and it draws a bunch of current and it trips the safety inside the tunalizer but on one cell it should be fine so we'll run the auto test it still sounds pretty ripper even on one cell voltage but as it ramps through there we'll get down to the end here and to show you there so at, at one cell still draws six amps it shows a 10,000 kV so normally they're going to be a little higher than what the the sticker is or the the label says envelope timing shows electronically at 25 degrees and you see the differences there in the a b and the c and the, the variation is going to be a 0.6. Symmetry is about the same, actually, 1.7. And the deviation pretty close, also 1.8. And that's, these are just the temp, temp, test temperatures. There's a temp sensor inside the motor. And since we did the 9500 at one cell testing, I figured uh, we'll do the, 80, or the 6500 at one cell also, just to get a point of reference.
All right, so one cell, uh, 6.7 amps, 6,800 kV, 27. So most of the stuff stayed the same from the first test, just the amp draw goes down because it's a lower voltage. And bell deviation, all that looks pretty much the same as it did on the two cell test. The kV number is real similar. Uh, like I said, just those two guys are gonna be quite a bit different. Everybody loves when we take stuff apart. So let's take this apart and see what it looks like inside. You've got your rear end bell screws. These are a two millimeter hex drive. And then there's a bunch of screws that go around the outside. But if I'm honest, I haven't taken one of these apart yet. Just gonna set these to the side. And then this guy's gonna come off like that. So there's your sensor assembly. No shims on the back side, as per usual. Most of the hobbying motors aren't gonna have shims on the back side of the motor. They're all gonna be on that end belt or the pinion shaft side. So get the end bell off and then you're going to want to slide the rotor up and out if you're ever doing cleaning or maintenance or rotor replacement. If you ever overheat a motor, the part that weakens is actually the magnet so you can replace the rotor. And since the, it wants to stick to one side or the other, getting a full wrap tube of material down in there is not going to be very easy. But you can do on the side that's away, it's stuck down to the bottom here, we're going to slide, I cut a piece of decal material and slide that guy into the little gap on the other side, get it down in there as far as you can. And then when you go to slide it out, you put a little pressure down towards that and slide it out on that instead of just dragging it along the, the, uh, the, the, the side there. Watch for shims. There's typically always gonna be shims on the pinion gear shaft side. Um, and there's gonna be one probably stuck down in the bearing as well. So what I usually like to do is just move it sideways so it slides off of the bearing race and then do one of those and it comes right out. So you get a wave, you're gonna get a wave washer and then a regular washer. The wave washer goes on the rotor side, the regular washer, or shim rather, goes on the bearing side. But here's the rotor, you see there it's sleeved so that it can't be exploded. And since we got it out of there with our super sweet install sleeve, we didn't cause any scratches or damage, but that's what they look like. That is a fancy rotor. You see your timing ring on the top. They are balanced as well. Front and rear, they are balanced. You see there's just a little tiny bit of material on the inside there. And then take a look here at the stator or the can assembly. Good looking everything there. Really pack the wires in that guy. For rotor reinstall, the trick is to make yourself a tube out of some material. I try to make it a little taller than the stator and only barely wrap around itself so it doesn't make everything kind of too tight. You're going to slide that down into the stator first, open that guy up, and then on our shims, you got your wave shim and then your regular shim. In that order, wave shim goes towards the rotor, the regular shim goes towards what would be the bearing side. Uh, and then you hold this guy nice and firm, get down in there between your guide, get the front side lined up and as you let go it kind of pulls itself in give it a little tap there to push it all the way in and then you can slide your sleeve out and you didn't scratch anything up on the way in so that's fantastic end bell goes back on sensor port goes towards the top now these you mean theoretically you can put these on upside down and right side up as well which can be problematic so make sure you pay attention that the uh, sensor ports go towards the solder tabs and then make sure that when you're reassembling something, I've seen it overlooked before, is that uh, you reset the timing to where it was. This guy was right about at 30, right there. Snug these guys up. There you have it. Reassembled. You did it. And then the uh, process is pretty much exactly the same for the bigger motor. It's just the difference is your sleeves and your, your material to, to guide things is going to be a little bit longer. So the main difference is here you see the sizes of the motors. We get them side by side 10, 10 millimeters longer on the 3662 over the 3652. Simple math. And again, those numbers are diameter and length. 36 diameter, 52, and a 62 millimeter length. Uh, fun stuff. The shafts are different sizes. You get, you get an eighth inch or 3.125 millimeter shaft on this guy and the heavy duty five millimeter shaft on the little bit longer motor or the 
550 plus size, I call it. Shaft length, this guy is listed as 18.5 length in millimeters, and this guy is listed as a 14.5, so you see just a slight difference in the length of the pinion gear shafts. Bearings are slightly different. The regular size motors, the front bearing is a nine by four by four, and the rear bearing is an eight by three by four. On the 3662, the front bearing is an 11 by five by five, and the rear is an eight by three by four. So in case you're As always, there's a link in the description down below to the product pages and the instruction manuals for both of these guys. So if you need any of the hard specs, you can find that all there. Now I know what you're asking. Drag racing fans, you're like, where's the speed control? What speed controls do we use this to use? XR10 Pro G2S would be your best bet. It's got the most tuning. XR8 would be the next choice, but the XR8 series of speed controls, the turbo and the boost isn't going to work with these motors. Those have a lockout on turbo and boost that it only works with A-scale motors. These aren't classified in that same under the Hobbywing sensor ID system, whatever the case may be. So unfortunately, unless you're not going to use turbo and boost then the XR10 Pro G2S would be the way to go. They're compatible with other speed controls that are sensors as well, so you can, like anything else in the RC world, they don't have to match, so to speak. Uh, but if you're going to use XR8, you can. They work totally fine, fully censored. You're just not going to have the option to use turbo and boost, so keep that in mind. We are working on a drag-specific speed control. It has been in the works for us some time. If you've been around the channel or if you follow the podcast, you've heard it mentioned before. It's been in development for a good long while, and as I guess you'd say, trends change and things like that we didn't want to rush that guy out so uh, still in the works we're going to have a drag racing speed control in the future mark my words if you didn't know we have a podcast it's called rc stuff powered by hobby wing we give away a free hobby wing combo each and every episode all you have to do to find out how to enter to win is listen to an episode look it up on your favorite podcast service it's called rc stuff powered by hobby wing if you do have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can email us directly, northamerica at hobbywing.com. And as always, folks, thanks for watching another episode of The Charlie Show, new every Tuesday, right here on the Hobbywing official YouTube channel. We will see you all next time.